letting people in. So guys, I wanted to introduce the project. And as Andrew said, I'm Tracy and I'm the long-term conditions project coordinator. Um, now one of the reasons that I was attracted to working with Croydon BM Forum is because I am an advocate for health and wellness. Um, I did run a health and wellness business for a few years and I know the importance of us looking after ourselves internally as well as externally. I'm sure many of you have heard the saying that your health is your wealth. And that's something, you know, it sounds like a, um, a cliche, but it actually is very, very true. Um, one of the things that attracted me to this project was some information that I'd like to read out to you. So in England, more than 50 million people have a long-term conditions. So that's what the acronym LTC means. So this group tend to be heavy users of the health service. Sorry, I'm still letting people in. Um, accounting for at least 70% of all NHS spend, but are likely to spend less than 1% of their time um, with health professionals. The rest of the time is spent with their carers, their families, or managing on their own as experts by experience. People with long-term conditions manage their health on a daily basis, but may need additional help to develop their condition in fulfilling their role as a self-manager. So as you can see, that's quite self-explanatory. One of the things I want to do, I want to introduce Dr. Shri Ekiniru. But before I do that, I would just like you guys to answer this first poll question. So... Can you guys see that? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to click on an answer to that. So when was the last time that you had your blood pressure checked? So if you just select the one that applies to you, I'm going to give you guys some more seconds. Oops, I can see people coming in as well. Yeah, five more seconds. Three, two, one and I'm going to end the poll. So 11% of you, um, sorry, 11 of you, 79% have said you've had one less than six months um, and the rest have said more than 12 months. So thanks so much for sharing that. Can you guys see the results? Yeah? Great, okay. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Dr. Sri Akinuru. But before I do that, I just would like to share a little bit about Dr. Akinuru. So Dr. Akinuru is a consultant in Croydon NHS, and he's a consultant in the acute medicine division. Um, he's currently the lead also for that medical unit. He has a qualifications, a bachelor's in medicine and surgery, and he's also a member of the Royal College of Physicians. He has a special interest in hypertension and um, he also does uh, the blood pressure clinic every Wednesday afternoon at Croydon University Hospital. So uh, Dr. Akinuru, I would just like to ask you to unmute yourself um, and then if you are ready, I will share the screen for you. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm ready. Thank you, Tracy, for inviting me to this forum and thank you, Andrew, as well. Um, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, I think uh, a month or a uh, few weeks ago, I'd done uh, one before, and uh, uh, Dr. Osuji, who's the medical director of the trust, was very keen to do one more for uh, you guys. So it's an absolute uh, pleasure to do this. Um, so as, uh, as Tracy was saying, I'm a medical consultant. I lead the acute medical unit at Croydon, and, uh, and I do a blood pressure clinic every Wednesday. What I'm going to do is, uh, when, when I wanted to talk about uh, uh, blood pressure, one of the slight uh, yeah, hitches was whether there were lots of GPs also among, among you. So the talk I'm going to talk might have some technical terms, but I will try to uh, keep it as straightforward, as without jargon as, uh, as possible. But uh, at any stage, if there is anything which is not clear, I'm, I'm op open to you can always raise your hand and we can, uh, you can ask me questions. After the presentation, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I will open the forum to questions and I will also tell you a few stories which uh, medicine is all about uh, patient stories and uh, with which we can learn so much as, as clinicians. So uh, I can share with you and hopefully that sort of uh, uh, 
uh, that sort of enlightens you as well as to uh, how to deal with blood pressure and stuff. So I'm happy to start if you guys are um, ready, so I can start with the presentation. Oops, sorry, wrong one. It's, let me share the screen. There we go. Yeah, so hypertension, um, we'll talk about definition, classifications, how do you diagnose what investigations it involves, management, complications, and, and something called as uh, secondary hypertension. You know, high blood pressure is called as hypertension, and most of which is uh, primary hypertension. So there is no one um, single cause which is causing the high blood pressure. But uh, in a small fragment of patients, in a small proportion of patients, there are underlying conditions which can raise the blood pressure as well, which we call as secondary hypertension. Thank you, Tracy. Next slide. Yeah, so <clears throat> elevated blood pressure is, uh, is uh, by definition, means somebody's blood pressure, it has got two readings, the top reading and the bottom reading. Having a blood pressure greater than 140 by 90 mmHg. Um, lots of times, um, re uh, patients come to me and say, hey, uh, the bottom reading is high or the top reading is high. So, so I will explain what is the importance of um, each and um, uh, of both of those. Blood pressure is uh, normally distributed uh, in, in the population. You know, when babies are born, the blood pressure is very small, but their heart rate is very fast because their blood vessels are so soft and, and the pressure is very small. But as you age, as we age or as we become wiser, the blood vessels become stiff and, and the blood pressure rises and the heart rate drops. So it has a normal, uh, normal di uh, distribution. You might have heard, uh, as Tracy was saying, you know, there are chronic illnesses, uh, the basis of which, on, on which lots of diseases are built. And the two chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension on which, you know, people can get strokes, heart attacks, um, uh, kidney problems, um, uh, eye problems. And, and if you can only control these things, um, you know, you can prevent loads of chronic, uh, uh, chronic conditions which debilitate and cause so much of uh, pain, distress to patients, relatives. Um, and, and so even a small rise in the blood pressure, it can increase uh, uh, problems with uh, death from heart disease uh, by 7%. And, uh, and it can increase the chance of stroke by um, uh, 10%. Even a tiny, tiny change in, in blood pressure. That's why when trials happen, looking at medications, they say even if there is a slight drop in blood pressure, the, the, the drug company could say, oh, this is very effective. The reason they say it, because long term, over a period of time, if you control your blood pressure, even tiny changes can have a huge impact. Yeah. Thank you. So as I've said, blood pressure is divided into two types. Primary hypertension, where 90, 95% of the cases where there is no underlying cause. It might be because of our genes. It might be because of our salt intake. It might be stress. It might be um, childhood malnutrition. Uh, it, it might be so many things. You know, a lot of uh, pregnant women, when they have uh, high blood pressure during pregnancy, you know, young women who come to me, and say, hey, you know, when I was pregnant, uh, during the late stages, my blood pressure was very, very high. And as soon as the baby was born, my blood pressure has normalized. And they, will, they, they ask me, oh, why should I continue taking these medications? It's because what happens is if the, in future, there are much higher risk, almost um, three times higher risk than normal women to have high blood pressure in future and cause complications of high blood pressure. But anyway, the primary hypertension, there is not one uh, single cause. It's a multifactorial illness. Secondary hypertension is a hypertension where there are some underlying causes which cause high blood pressure um, and which I will go through as the slides progress. Thank you. So secondary hypertension, there is a condition called as, uh, you know, we have got glands just around our kidneys, which produce chemicals. They're normally produced in everybody, but in some people, they're produced in excess. And, uh, and that can cause something called as Kahn syndrome. Sometimes 
That's why. Some, that's why. So, sometimes the blood supply to the kidneys, the arteries are narrowed, what we call as renal artery stenosis that can cause a high blood pressure as well. There are certain conditions, you know, some young patients have come to me and said, oh, I, I have very high blood pressure, but the next moment it's very low. I get panic attacks, I get sweating episodes, I get palpitations. There is a condition called as pheochromocytoma. It's also uh, it's a, a type of a tumor in, in the adrenal glands which produces excess chemicals and that can raise high blood pressure. You know, we have had patients where the patient was diagnosed as has some mental illness because all she had was uh, uh, panic attacks, anxiety episodes, and she was going to the GP and everybody thought this is just some anxiety related problem, but underlying she had pheochromocytoma. Having said that, these are very small proportion of patients. You know, I'm talking about say one to maybe one percent or less than one percent when it comes to pheochromocytoma. So you mostly I would concentrate on essential hypertension, which is a multifactorial illness. Again, you know, the blood pressure has two readings: the top reading and the bottom reading. When the top reading is high, you call it as systolic hypertension, and it's more common when the blood vessels become stiff. And uh, this is more common in our elderly population. As we age, the top blood pressure reading raises. And over, you know, when you're very old, it, it drops again. The lower reading is, uh, is called as the diastolic blood pressure. Sometimes it is high and the top reading is normal. A lot of young people can have this. And in fact, a lot of, lot of fit people uh, who are who are slightly um, who are who are not slim who are slightly chubby can also have a lower blood pressure which is high. Again, you know, even doctors come to me and say, "Ki, hey, Dr. Aknuri, you know what? My lower reading is very high. What should I do?" It does not always need treatment. I always tell them, you know, basics. Um, you might, uh, I might sound like a broken record by the end of this talk that, you know, salt has a big effect. So I would say, you know, please cut down salt. Please cut down salt. Yeah. Okay. When you have blood pressure, um, blood pressure is divided into various stages. Stage one, stage two, and stage three. And Unlike other illnesses, it's a very silent illness. A lot of people don't even know that they have a high blood pressure. Many of the patients come to me and say, Ki, you know what? I feel absolutely well. I went to this gym membership and uh, he checked my blood pressure. He wouldn't give me membership. My, my blood pressure was so, so high. So I think it's important to grade blood pressure. So stage one is when you have blood pressure greater than 140 by 90. Stage two is 160 by 100. And stage three is 180 by 110. So when people have um, stage two and stage three blood pressure, then usually they need medications. When they have just stage one blood pressure, unless they had a heart attack or a stroke or kidney problem, I just don't if young people come with stage one hypertension, I don't straight away jump in and, and give them medication. I would, I would rather, I would rather um, ask them to change their lifestyle. Clearly, there is no uh, one, uh, you know, <clears throat> again, it's very interesting. Um, the accident emergency doctors call me and say, Ki, Dr. Agnuri, I've got this uh, elderly lady who's come in, had a fall, and blood pressure is high. And when I go to see her, I mean, she's in a neck brace, or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, she had a fracture, she's in a lot of pain. So is one blood pressure truly means um, high blood pressure? Because, you know, when, when we give medications for blood pressure, it's a chronic illness. It's not like an antibiotic where I use a five-day course and stop it, right? So I need to be absolutely sure that this patient is not in distress, not in, uh, not in pain not in, uh, you know, angst or worry, because those things can raise blood pressure as well. So for, for us as physicians, we have to see at least three or four readings which are consistently high to diagnose a high blood pressure. Yeah, many factors influence pain, anxiety, stress, um, exercise, yes. And, and technical factors as well. Obviously, you know, when I tell patients to uh, go and uh, buy blood pressure cuffs, it, uh, the cuffs can come in small, medium, and large. If you use an inappropriate cuff, if you use a small cuff on a big arm, maybe the blood pressure will be 
appear as high whereas if you use a large cuff on a small person uh, the blood pressure might be falsely low so i think there are some technical factors as well so a lot of people a uh, lot of patients when they come to my clinic you might have heard of this condition called as white coat hypertension so uh, i had this patient a fantastic patient his blood pressure was very very high and uh, and uh, and i had headaches dizziness so he had to be admitted to the hospital so i saw him we gave him treatment and his headaches disappeared his blood pressure got better and uh, he was sent home uh, and he came back to my clinic and the blood pressures were high again so i said oh what happened uh, mr so and so um, have you stopped taking the medications or he said no 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 i'm absolutely religious of taking the medications but whenever i come to clinic my blood pressure is high so you know sometimes clinic blood pressures are not the best way of checking somebody's blood pressure so checking blood pressure at home and particularly when you are not distressed so even if you have a blood pressure machine at home i always tell my patients that they should be completely rested their back should be supported their arm should be supported and rest for at least 10 minutes don't have tea coffee or chocolate don't have anything which stimulates you then check your blood pressure in the arm then wait for a couple of minutes then repeat your blood pressure again and if you take average to, if you take two readings you can take the low, lower of the two readings or if they are equal to each other you can take average of both of them you can do morning and evening and if you do monday to friday if you have a five day sort of a graph then that that is much better indicator of what your blood pressure is than when you come to clinic there is a gold standard way of checking blood pressure and the gold standard way of checking blood pressure is doing a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring and uh, the the criteria for diagnosing high blood pressure in a 24 hour uh, blood pressure monitoring is slightly different because um, because the readings are slightly smaller compared to clinic blood pressures again uh, you know the, to get a 24 hour blood pressure monitor we we always run short of we uh, yeah that's fine we we it's okay now we we always run short of machines so so you know if you buy a blood pressure machine you get a decent uh, uh, british and irish hypertension society um, validated machines uh, omron is a good machine you know you can get it for 30 quid in any boots pharmacy or something and and once if you buy it it stays for uh, it stays for years the only thing is you have to change battery you don't have to buy fancy stuff you know some people buy 100 pounds one i say simple simple blood pressure machine is yeah okay next mm -hmm. okay thank you uh, thank you tracy <laughs> thank you um so there are few investigations we do uh, one of the one one organ which has the biggest strain uh, uh, when you have a high blood pressure is the heart because you know say if you if you go to a gym and lift uh, 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 weights your biceps becomes muscular uh, and if you go if you have a high blood pressure over a period of time the same thing can happen to the heart and it can become muscular you know it's okay if your biceps are muscular it's good for your body maybe but if the heart becomes muscular its function becomes suboptimal heart should not be too muscular as well so we do some basic investigations to check a ecg echocardiogram which is a jelly scan of the heart we can't do for every patient but in, in patients where we think uh, this patient has strain on the heart we do this investigations we check the urine sample because you know blood pressure can have an effect on the kidneys and it can damage the kidneys and people can start leaking protein there can be sometimes some blood in the urine as well so we can measure and we do blood tests to just check how kidneys are working because kidneys are very very vital uh, one of the most important organs in the body which regulates blood pressure is kidneys uh, so when you have high blood pressure it can affect the kidneys but if you have kidney problem also people can get high blood pressure and uh, uh, now i can't do it because of covid i can't get too close to patients but uh, we used to look into the back of the eyes because the small blood vessels on the retina because they are very small when you have a very high blood pressure the blood vessels can burst so checking eyes is is also vital just like diabetes you know you check the eyes so yeah thank you 
um, so weight and um, height um, and and the other thing is <clears throat> there's something called as a metabolic profile you know people who are prone to diabetes are also prone to hypertension sometimes people who are prone to hypertension can also have diabetes and their uh, cholesterol could be high as well so if you if you stack up all these three things oh diabetes blood pressure and and cholesterol that can have a devastating effect on uh, on on your blood vessels and they will fire up the blood vessels of your heart of the blood vessels which supply the brain and they can cause strokes they can cause heart attacks they can cause kidney problems so these are basic things you know um, for a for a very long time um, as as a doctor when i trained as a registrar we used to concentrate on medication medication and medication but more and more i see medicine um, what especially with high blood pressure and diabetes what i feel is there's a huge lifestyle choice we have to make cutting down salt cutting down fatty food cutting down um, takeaways and um, and stuff so so we have to be very careful with that okay who to treat and when to treat yeah so as i said when the blood pressure is stage 1 so today i saw a young lady and she said, you know what, um, I've got a healthy lifestyle, I'm only 26, and, and, uh, but unfortunately I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. The GP straight away put her on a blood pressure medication. I'm not saying that's a that's completely wrong thing to do, but what I would, uh, what I would have said is, oh, no, actually, you know what, let's wait. Let's wait for three months. I want you to completely change your diet completely cut down salt i want you to exercise i want you to lose three to five percent of your body weight and see what happens to the blood pressure then i would start you on medication so in stage one um, i usually don't start medication unless unless they have had a heart attack in the past unless they had kidney problems unless they have diabetes uh, and there is a uh, there is a you know you uh, people your gps particularly can calculate your cardiovascular risk uh, there's a calculator called as Q risk uh, online calculator. If you put your blood pressure, lipids, glucose, and stuff, uh, it can calculate what are your chances of having heart attack or strokes. What what percentage? So so when when they have a high percentage, like uh, a ten year cardiovascular risk greater than twenty percent, that's when I treat. Okay, but if it is stage two or stage three, I don't even wait. I treat straight away. Yeah, because it has come to a stage where we can't take any chances. So I would, but interestingly, recently uh, during COVID, I couldn't do face-to-face uh, -face clinics. So I had to call patients and had this, um, uh, this teacher who, was a, who had stage two blood pressure from, from the GP letter. She had stage two hypertension. So in all honesty, I would have said, oh, let's start medication. But what happened was she said, see, I'm 36. Uh, I know I've got stage two blood pressure, but if you can just give me two months, I will change my lifestyle. I've been eating a lot of crisps, a lot of nuts, and the lockdown hasn't helped. We watch a lot more television, and uh, and my blood pressure has gone up. And uh, and true to her word, uh, word in two months' time, once uh, I saw her when the first wave of COVID was peaking, and when I brought her back to my clinic, just when the first wave ended, a blood pressure almost normalized. Um, having said that, having said that, when I start people on blood pressure, my biggest problem is a lot of patients because it's a chronic medication. A lot of patients stop their medication on their own, and you know what? Well, they come back to hospital with a stroke or a heart attack. So I don't want any patients to stop blood pressure medications on their own. Unless obviously you know the blood pressure is very low, they're not feeling well, the dizzy. But always better to um, stop if you want to stop a medication. Always have that discussion either with the GP or with your consultant in the hospital or even with the pharmacist. Okay, and when the blood pressure is very very high, <clears throat> very very high, you know it needs more urgent treatment. Thank you. So goes without saying goes without saying diet alcohol exercise relaxation therapy um, let me tell you one thing let's say i work at croydon university hospital i take a bus from east croydon so every day i walk to east croydon 
and take a bus from there to uh, West Wickham where I live. But when I'm walking and when I'm coming in the morning, I see a lot of children, you know, with full of energy, full of life. Uh, they must be what, 15, 16, 17? But a lot of them are eating chicken and chips. Disastrous, I'm telling you. At 17, 18, if you start eating, that the blood pressure slowly creeps up. Because it's such a silent illness, people won't even realize that they had high blood pressure. Not lots of my patients. You know, when, when I trained as a doctor, um, I used to always think blood pressure is an illness of aging. That's what we are taught. Blood pressure is an illness of uh, bad lifestyle and it's also very much associated with obesity. When I started my clinic at Croydon, you won't believe this, but majority of my patients are between 35 to 40 and they're not obese and they're very hardworking. Um, they have got all uh, you know, busy lifestyles, but you know what? All of them are eating too much salt, too much salt. So please, uh, if there is one uh, message uh, there is, is to, is to please uh, cut down salt. All call again, we did a, pay, we did a study in, uh, in uh, uh, patients from my uh, clinic and uh, people who drink a little bit of excess alcohol can have high blood pressure as well. So this is very important. Okay, so the various medications for, um, for um, uh, blood pressure, the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and there is a particular pattern we choose. If the patients are below the age of 55, we choose one agent. If the patients are above 55 or if they're Afro-Caribbean, we use a different agent because how we are, you know, um, um, some medications are more effective in some than others. Okay. Next. So step one, we use uh, uh, ACE inhibitors or calcium channel blockers depending upon age or ethnicity. And step two, we add A plus, uh, that is ACE inhibitors for calcium channel blockers. Then we add ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, diabetics, and, and there are other medications like spinolactone, alpha blockers, beta blockers. Um, yeah. So target blood pressure, you know, above a certain age, when, when people are above 80, uh, last year when I went, um, yeah, this year the conference was cancelled because of COVID, because, but last year when I went to the British and Irish Hypertension Society conference, they were saying, above the age of 80, uh, you have to use the standing blood pressure as a blood pressure when you want to add more medications. Because a lot of elderly patients I get who have high blood pressures, but uh, you know, uh, sometimes we doctors believe too much in medicine, so we keep on adding medications. When we have too much of medications that cause lots of side effects. So, so I think we have to be careful, especially in elderly patients, a standing blood pressure is useful while up, up titrating and hypertensive. Yeah, next. Thank you. So complications of um, uh, blood pressure, you know, heart failure because there's strain on the heart. Um, as, as the heart has to pump against a high blood pressure, you know, our heart beats 70 times. And if it has to beat against a high pressure, there's a strain on the heart and eventually the heart can fail as well. But there are other conditions which I've already mentioned like stroke, you know, one of the one of, one of the saddest thing is I don't want any of my patients to, uh, I want them to be outside in the, com in the community, enjoying their life. There was a, uh, but I'm seeing more and more, the stroke ward almost calls me every other day saying, I've got this young patient who had a stroke because of high blood pressure. Dr. Aknuri, can you come and, uh, you know, uptitrate his medications? Uh, you know, I have a, uh, I had a patient a few weeks ago, fantastic patient was, you uh, very hard working and the only thing was his mother was cooking for him and what had happened was just at the start of covid his mother had a stroke so the son who was working as an it i think it consultant uh, because of a lot of people going off uh, because of covid he, he could not have home cooked food so he went to this Tesco meals, uh, ready meals, which is, you know, you get a sandwich, crisps, and a fizzy drink, I think. And he didn't have time because lots of his colleagues were taking out. So he was eating that. You know, his blood pressure went high and he, he ended up having a stroke. So that's one of the devastating um, uh, 
uh, things of um, of uh, of uh, high blood pressure. Creatinine again, your kidneys can uh, fail. You know, just today I was treating somebody who is only 52 but has got end stage kidney disease, so he has to have dialysis three times a week. It's so I'm not saying it's painful, but it's it takes over your life if somebody needs dialysis three times a week, where you have to go to hospital three times a week and spend a few hours on a machine. So, you know, and, and one of the biggest causes of uh, kidney failure or renal failure is high blood pressure. Blindness, again, I, I used to have a young patient, very young patient, uh, and um, she took cocaine. She used to use regular cooking and that made her have very high blood pressure and cause burst blood vessels in the black back of her retina and she was almost blind, which was, which was so sad to see. When I was talking about blood pressure, I said, you know, most of it is essential blood pressure and uh, a very small proportion is secondary hypertension. So they are, I usually suspect secondary hypertension when the patients are very young. So GP writes a letter says, I've got a very young patient, but the patient has uh, high blood pressure with some damage, then I'm thinking of secondary causes. So, you know, sometimes there are conditions like Consed Noma where patient can have a low potassium and a high blood pressure. So, uh, or sometimes patients can have panic attacks, palpitation, sweating episodes, or if somebody has high blood pressure, I did an ultrasound scan and the kidneys are shrunk, then I know that the blood vessel, blood supply to the kidneys is, uh, is uh, reduced as well. So those are the patients where I'm suspecting uh, secondary hypertension. And there are rare causes of um, hypertension like steroid excess, some genetic conditions, um, and some uh, abnormality of the blood vessels uh, uh, in, in the chest which can cause high blood pressure. I used, as a registrar, I used to have this patient whose blood pressure, the blood pressures were measured by the nurses and uh, the patient would come into the clinic. Once when he come, his blood pressure used to be high. And so we used to increase the medication. Second time when he came, his blood pressure used to be low. So this happened, I think, two or three times. And I asked the patient, why is your blood pressure high and low? And he said, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, when I go to this room, the blood pressure is high. When I go to the other room, my blood pressure is low. Then it stuck to me, actually, they're checking blood pressure in, in different arms. And as soon as they said that, I checked the pulse in both arms and one of the arms, there was no pulse at all. That was because the blood supply to one of the, uh, was completely blocked because of, uh, because of uh, atherosclerosis and fat and stuff. So, so there, there are some rare causes of high blood pressure, but most of it is, uh, is essential hypertension where we can't identify, we can't put it as a single cause. Yeah. Yeah, next. Um, and there are uh, various investigations we do. We do a ECG, echocardiogram, ultrasound. There are some uh, uh, chemicals we can check in the urine sample as well, which can um, suggest us whether this is, uh, this is uh, a, if there is a secondary hypertension. This is, uh, this, this question is primarily for, uh, for um, you know, uh, for junior doctors and uh, general practitioners. But uh, just choosing if you are a certain age and if you are Caucasian, what is the choice of blood pressure medications you use? We usually use ACE inhibitors or ARPC. And uh, what, if, you have, uh, if, uh, if there are patients who have already used three agents, what are the other agents? You've got alpha blockers, beta blockers, or spinalite. And then some there are hormonal causes of high blood pressure as well, like cons, passion, sacromegaly, or steroid factors. So in summary, these these are the things which I discussed. But I'm very open um, to questions and uh, and um, yeah. take it from there. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Akinyeri. That was very informative and detailed. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Um, if you could um, 
you know decide if you want to ask a question there's two ways that you can do that you can either type a question into the chat which i think someone's put a comment in there already they have and i'm about i'll read that out in a minute so you can either type a question in the chat and the chat is at the bottom of your screen so it should be along the bottom of the screen you can click that and type your question or if you would like to ask a question to Dr. Akinu directly, um, please raise your hand. Uh, oh, we can't see everybody. So if you unmute yourself, but obviously we can't have everyone asking questions at once. Um, is that Mar Margreta? Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, just give me one second and let me read the one that's in the chat from SB. So Dr. Akinu, SB has said, how can I lower my blood pressure and come off amylomulfidine? Um, 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 yeah, so I think the, the best ways to cut down blood pressure is eating a lot of fruit and veg, exercising at least three times a week. You know, there the are a lot of people who have got arthritis in the knees and they ask me, how do I exercise? Then I say, you know, I know it's difficult for me to put you in your shoes, but I would suggest if, if you could walk, that's great. If not, if you could swim, that would be great. When you're buying foods in supermarkets, whether it's Lidl, Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer, always look at the traffic lights. Buy foods which have low salt in them. So buy foods which are green. Do not buy foods which are amber or red. Any foods which are low in sugar, salt and fat are generally good for health definitely definitely low in salt and uh, uh, so those are the three things the other thing is coming off amlodipine i must say one thing ki blood pressure unfortunately as of now it's a chronic illness we can titrate the medications but we can't completely come off it a lot of patients come to me saying ki actually you know what i've changed my life completely around and uh, and uh, I want to come off the medication, then what I tell them is, absolutely, we can reduce the medication. Sometimes we can't completely come off. And some patients, because you know they are frustrated, they might come off their medications on their own. And for a month, they will check their blood pressure. It's absolutely fine. Because blood pressure is completely asymptomatic. Six months later, it goes high to 200, and they won't even realize when they had a dizzy episode or fainted and came back to a hospital. So, so unfortunately, the answer is we can reduce the dose of amlodipine. I can't promise that you will completely come off it. But, but having said that, please turn your life completely around and then see your GP if your blood pressure is completely normalized. The GP can trial it for a short period, like two or three weeks, and then do a 24-hour blood pressure monitoring and see. But having said that, amlodipine is a safe blood pressure medication. If, uh, if I have to give advice, my advice would be to continue taking it. Thank you. Um, Mar Margarita, did you want to ask the question? It's the same question I was going to ask. <laughs> ah, so has he answered it? Brilliant. Okay. So we have another question from Mar Marquita, Marka. It's you mentioned Mar salt. Marco. In Marco. Okay. You mentioned salt intake. I don't take salt but my blood pressure is high. So, um, again, as I've said, some people, so salt is a big uh, factor where we can, it's, a, it's like a remodifiable risk factor. Having said that, some people are genetically prone to high blood pressure and that, uh, you know, we can't correct it. As I've said, it's a multifactorial illness. One of the big factors is a salt, but salt may not be everything. Some people, even if they completely cut down, what had happened is their blood pressure has risen over a period of time and their blood vessels have become stiff and they stay stiff for the rest of their, you know. Having said that, if you control your salt, there are high chances that, that it will be better controlled compared to eating, eating salt. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question from Samsung Galaxy 7, um, S7. Um, just took my blood pressure. The top reading was 148 and the bottom at number 77. Is that considered very high? It is, uh, it's not considered high. It's, it's not considered very high. 
this is something what I call a stage one hypertension. So what I would say is just keep an eye on your blood pressure. And usually it's better to take two readings. And after 15 minutes of rest, when your back is supported, when your arms are rested, and it's better to monitor it over five days, five to six days. Ideally, they say two weeks, but even if you do it for five days, the readings we want is below 135 by 85, below 135 by 85. Just one reading on its own does not uh, diagnose high blood pressure. Okay. You mentioned salt intake. Oh, someone yeah. said it again. Yeah. She doesn't take uh, salt, but her blood pressure is high. There is a salty taste in my mouth and everything tastes salty. I have to drink lots more water and I also get headaches. Are you able to say why that is? When, when you have high blood pressure, uh, salty taste, a salty taste in the mouth, it's difficult for me to explain because I haven't come across that often. But a lot of people, when they have high blood pressure, it puts a strain on, on the kidneys. And what the kidneys try to do is, they try to wash the salt off because your blood pressure is high. And the way they are able to wash the salt off is by you passing a lot of urine. So a lot of people tell me that when the blood pressure is high, they wake up sometimes having to pass urine. You know, uh, that is something which commonly happens with diabetes, but sometimes it can happen with high blood pressure as well. And, uh, and they can get headaches because the blood vessels, when the pressure is high, when the heart is beating with high pressure, it is felt in the blood vessels in the brain and that causes headache. But a uh, but lot of people say, oh, I don't take salt, but I use this broth or something to make the curry. And that might have a lot of salt in it. You know, simple sandwiches we buy, simple bread we buy, it's always a good practice to look at the traffic lights. A lot of people don't think, oh, I don't add any salt. But uh, if you say, if you don't add any salt, uh, you know, maybe in some of the spices you use, just be cautious that there isn't any salt there. And whatever you buy outside, always look at the traffic lights. Unfortunately, in life, anything which tastes too good is, is, not, um, is not great for the body. Thank you so much, Dr. Akinuru. We have another question um, from Amanda Salmon. Can you unclog your veins and arteries? If yes, how? I, I think you. Uh, I think you could, not completely, but definitely you could. The way you could unclog is by eating fruit and veg, cutting down on biscuits, chocolates, controlling your blood pressure, and controlling your diabetes if you have. So if you do these things, exercise regularly, the blood vessel health is much, much better. Yeah, you know, just like um, the, the tubes in your house, if, uh, if there is a lot of uh, gunk, you know, the, the tubes get clogged up. But, you know, you, you, could, um, uh, you could not completely, but definitely to a certain extent, you can unclog them by eating a lot of fruit, veg, exercising regularly, keeping your blood pressure under control and diabetes under control. And nothing rocket science. There are lots of people who are saying that fancy diet, this diet, you know, what all your grandparents have taught you, simple stuff, you know, home cooked food uh, and exercising regularly, not eating too much fat, too much salt, too much sugar. Okay, we have another question from SB. Um, SB has been told that eating the vegetable chow chow raw um, is good for managing high blood pressure. Is that true? I don't know what chow chow is, but they say eating beetroot is very helpful for blood pressure. I know that some studies have happened where um, they eat, uh, you know, the beetroot juices. Beetroot is supposed to be very, very good for blood pressure. Uh, I don't think it was statistically significant that it completely is an alternative to medication. But, uh, but fruits, green leafy vegetables, even fruits which have a lot of potassium in it. You know, potassium is a different type of salt compared to sodium, which is the salt which we found in, uh, in the table salt. And the potassium is found in fruits and vegetables. So those are supposed to be better for blood pressure. Thank you so much. Um, chow chow, I think, is a green uh, vegetable. 
that people have from the Caribbean um, use. I think we usually put it in soup, but um, then it definitely lowers blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. We are going to have a diet. Oh, someone's speaking. Who's speaking? I was. I was. Uh, yeah, I think we are going to have a, a dietitian who comes from a Caribbean slash African um, aspect of sharing with food. And we're going to be doing that in the diabetes talk and in further talks as well. So we will look at the foods um, that can help us to manage our long term health conditions better. And that will be an up and coming event. Um, so uh, the next question, can blood pressure affect your hearing, Dr. Akinuri? Mm -hmm pressure affect your hearing not not particularly i don't think not not particularly the, the um no hello yes not, okay not does someone no. does someone want to ask a question uh, who has taken themselves off mute no okay um, Dr. Akinuri, would you mind just leaving us with a, with a couple of myths? I'm just going to let you think about some high blood pressure myths that you've possibly heard from your patients um, and just sharing that with us and maybe some of the consequences of people, you know, those myths and how it's impacted on their health. But what I wanted to do um, is share uh, another poll with you guys, if I could. Um, and it would be, uh, are you, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Akinuru, um, being able to check your blood pressure at home. So I'd like to ask those of you in the audience, do you have a device to check your blood pressure at home? So I'll give you all time to answer. If you could just click yes or no. Give you some more, I'll give you a few seconds, counting down, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, end that poll. 50% um, of you said yes, you're able to check your pressure at home, and 50% of you said no, that you're not able to, so, okay. Okay, so Dr. Akiniru, have you thought about some high blood pressure myths that you have heard from some patients? I think, uh, I think uh, one myth I've, uh, I commonly encounter is they think uh, blood pressure is, um, you take the medication for a month and it's completely cured. That isn't the case. Um, and unfortunately, it's a chronic illness. You can control it. And a lot of patients, you know, majority of patients, you can normalize your blood pressure as well. But without medication, you can't completely take it away. Um, even if that happens, that's very rare. One other myth is a uh, lot of people say, oh, I have been taking herb herbs and stuff and, uh, and I've stopped my blood pressure medications. I think, um, I think that's fine, but uh, you know, if it is herbs coming from natural plants and stuff, that's okay. But if it is coming from some corner store, I, I, I would be cautious about them because uh, because I think blood pressure and diabetes are two illnesses where there is a lot of research which has happened, and there is uh, good evidence to show that majority of the medications are beneficial uh, to control blood pressure, but also protective. To the heart and also to the kidneys especially when covid happened there was a huge talk about some of the blood pressure medications being stopped but uh, now uh, it's it's clear that you should not stop these medications unless your doctor has advised you to stop the medication there, okay there thank you someone has their hands up who um ipad did you want to ask a question yeah. and i can see yeah yes i do <laughs> okay do you want to ask a question Yes, um, I get terribly confused. Um, I, doctor, I've got what is called an arterial venous malformation in my brain. I've had three brain ops and, and a bleed on the brain. And, um, and I've also had cancer, right? And when I was, I've been given the all clear from the cancer of the uterus. Um, but um, 
on my last checkup during the last um, lockdown, um, they called me back to the hospital after my final um, scan. They called me back to the hospital and they believed that they saw a shadow on the base of my lung. It turned out to be nothing, but I was told before I went that um, it was potentially a clot on the base of my lung. Uh, so I went into panic mode and um, immediately took what I take for um, when I travel, when I, when I go on long haul flights, um, I take um, an aspirin. And I took one aspirin every day for three days. And it really, I, I started getting all the pains in my head um, because it had um, uh, increased my blood flow. Um, that I was, and I thought that I was, was going to have another bleed on the brain. Now, um, I know that I've got, I've got the amlidopine um, for blood pressure. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. I've got amlidopine for blood pressure and I've also got um, bez uh, fibra yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. cholesterol. Now, um, I, I just get really confused about um, the uh, impact if I if I was to like for example change my diet um, to address my blood pressure whether that will affect the ADM in my brain no I think um, you know when your blood pressure is high and if you have a AVM in the brain it doesn't help because a high blood pressure can rupture the AVM so it's all the more important that you continue to take your amlodipine, follow the low salt diet. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's it's absolutely vital that you take your amlodipine. Yeah. When but when I took the one tablet of aspirin for three consecutive days, what well, just one tablet, yeah. I started getting the electric shock pains in my in my brain. Like yeah. I before they gave me the op they put they put two pieces of glue in my ADM okay yeah um so um yeah so I'm really sort of cautious about anything that goes into my body I'm just I think I think you can be re reasonably reassured uh, that amlodipine is safe blood pressure medications are better Aspirin is a blood thinning medication, and if you have a AV malformation, if there is a bleed, it will make the bleeding worse. Right. So, so I think any blood thinning medication you have to be careful about. Um, right. Um, so, and even when people have a clot in the lung, the treatment is not aspirin; it's a different mm -hmm. medication. Right. So, yeah. So, well, so taking amlodipine is important. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry, we're going to have to just take one more question because Marjorie has been waiting. So Marjorie, um, I'm going to let you have your question. It is eight o'clock, people. I'm so sorry that we're going over. Marjorie, do you want to ask a question? This will be the last one. I wanted to say something. I just took my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. I did two readings. The first one was 134 over 64. And the second one was 135 over 63. Is that good or bad? Good. Very good. 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 Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, and that's a fantastic note to end on. Listen, thank well, you. I do, I do that twice a week anyway. I take my blood pressure twice a week. Is that too often or, or what? I, I think just about right. Mm -hmm. Just about right. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Well, so, sorry, everybody. So, oh, I really love the lovely session. Thank you, Tracy. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's okay. Well, that's no problem. Thank you thank so you much. much. Well, I want to thank all of you for attending, but more importantly, I want to thank Dr. Akinuru for giving us your time for this hour, and we do mm -hmm. hope that you will come back again. 
Um, before you guys go, I just kind of wanted to share with you why we're doing this long-term conditions project. Um, Dr. Akinuru is the proof that the BME community, a huge amount of us, and in Croydon especially, are the ones who are suffering with these long-term conditions such as high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes and respiratory illnesses. Guys, we really do not need to start thinking about our future generations and what we're passing down to our children. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Andrew's passionate about this project and why I'm working with him to try and encourage our community to start thinking differently about health. There are going to be many events that we will do. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, we can't do live events. But just to let you all know, we do have a wellness centre within the Whitgift Shopping Centre in Croydon. And once we're able to open back again, please come in and visit us and talk to our team. There are various aspects of health and mental health that we are looking to help people with, um, but mainly looking at long-term health conditions. I'm sure Dr Akinuru and also his colleagues, who we often hear say that we don't mind if you make us redundant but not in the sense of uh, that we don't want to do our jobs anymore yeah. but that people are taking care of their health and their well-being the way that they should do so they're trying to empower us to take back that control so I'm going to let Andrew say the last few words. Um, I'm so sorry, the hour, I probably should have scheduled it slightly longer, but you live and you learn. So I will try and schedule the next talk for a bit longer. Andrew, do you want to close us off? Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, Doctor, as well. Wonderful session I was here. Um, I actually took my, um, my blood pressure reading at the same time. And my one was 136 over 96. Wow.